In this video, we are going to discuss the Nomads. That means exploring their military forces as well as their deep-seated beliefs, tactics, politics, and religion. I don't know if politics and religion have a place in games, but alright. What the hell, I'll give this guy the benefit of the doubt. Although I'm so mad, I might just have to like and subscribe. The Nomad Nation was proclaimed in 1NC. But this story starts way earlier. Way earlier. We're going back to the 21st century. Actually, you know what? Let's go back even further to the 1500s. Miguel Lopez de Legazpi had already spent 40 years engaging in barbarous adventures across Mexico as one of the original conquistadors. He was known simply as the Elder. The old man had come to the southeast to conquer Manila for Spain, and the first place he stopped was an island in Manila Bay. It would come to be known as Corregidor, though it's not clear why. In the Spanish Empire, a Corregidor was a royally appointed mayor of a colonial district. The word comes from Corregir, meaning to correct, and some theorize that Corregidor Island referred to the financial corrections of a toll booth, or possibly a penal institution. The island would continue to be a focal point of defense and violence for centuries as part of the Philippines. The settlement of Corregidor Island was initiated by Legazpi but the Corregidor Foundation was created from a bus full of casualties. It was sometime in the 21st century. Narco gang violence continued to plague portions of Latin America. A school bus filled with young heirs to influential North and South American families was headed to a prestigious international school. Collateral damage from the Narcos gangs claimed the lives of those students, and the surviving families vowed horrible retribution. They created the Corregidor Foundation in order to erase this scourge from the political equation. It wasn't just about eliminating the power of the drug cartels, it was about direct, cruel punishment. These oligarchic families collaborated to launch their prison, a floating coffin, a living death in orbit around the earth. No human rights activists would ever see it. No mob boss would ever escape from it. This was Corregidor Station, and it was a floating jail, a testament to the vengeance of the billionaire class. The Presidium was a brutal place, but at least it was not stratified. Griselda Camarga was the Queen of Barranquilla and the leader of the Caribbean cartel. She was one of the most dangerous women in Colombia before she was arrested and sentenced to death and life aboard Corregidor. An all-female barracks module was constructed on the cheap and added to the station. Camargo shipped there alongside a host of other dangerous female inmates and a group of all-women guards. In a display of classic sexism, the male guards labeled all the men's toilets BAMF and all the women's toilets P The newcomers were not amused. The female guards were all just as callous and brutal, equally participatory in an unjust system that served the whims of the Latam billionaire class. Griselda de Camargo was also unamused. She was a killer, a gang warrior, and she was not interested in being denigrated for having her own bathrooms. So, the female guards and prisoners just started using the men's rooms and beating the sh** of anyone who said otherwise. Ever since, all bathrooms in Corregidor have been completely gender neutral. Life in the prison was cruel and arbitrary. It was governed by prison rules of secrecy and survival of the meanest. Although most of the inmates were kept sedated and in sleep, they were frequently thawed out not for reasons of health or safety, but just to torment them, to remind them of their situation. Despite the protests of the public, there was just no force that could defeat the powerful bureaucratic apparatus that existed to protect Corregidor. Inmates were therefore sentenced not to life, but to death in life, trapped in orbit as the world slipped by. And besides, the international order was in chaos. To quote Antonio Gramisi, the old world is dying and the new world struggles to be born. Now is the time of monsters. The global economy was in tatters after the stock market crunch and the failure of Project Dawn. Corporations often ruled like feudal dystopic lords. The United States, Russia, and the European Union, all of them were collapsing and in that order. Hey, look at that, a link to a video I already did on Ariadna and Project Dawn, cool. The Transnational Corregidor Foundation was not spawned the ravages of age. Funding dwindled, conditions worsened, resources became less and less consistent. This station, known as the Presidium, or Fortress, was supposed to be somewhat self-sufficient, with the Foundation's investments paying for maintenance. But it was not immune to changing geopolitics back on the surface. China was reinventing itself as Yu Jing after gobbling up its neighbors. The Pan-Asian Alliance was preparing to induct Chile and Brazil as new members under the banner of Destino Tecnologica, 
that technology and new ideas were the road to the future. Brazil and Chile withdrew from the Corregidor Foundation, ending their association and use of the prison. I'm sure that it was cold comfort to the remaining prisoners, who now faced an uncertain future, trapped in a decades-old space station as humanity passed them by on the way to the stars. That stellar exodus required new developments. The construction of several space elevators became an international race. Corporations and countries entered into direct and fierce competition. Building even one elevator was a monumental megaproject that required a colossal amount of land and infrastructure. Every location became a town, then a city, then a bustling hive of activity, all filled with construction workers, engineers, and designers, and unending legions of people who provided services for those workers. Their number also included mercenaries. Unregulated soldiers of fortune were common back then, especially compared to the modern era. O12 was non-existent or new, and lacked the legal authority to intervene. During the Central American Campaign, the Lunar Colony Revolts, and the Second Nanotech War, mercenaries were loosed upon civilian areas with predictably barbaric results. It was no different in Eastern Africa, with the Road Wars. Corporations engaged in fierce competition to build that aforementioned infrastructure required to support the elevator project. Many enlisted local ethnic groups, arming them and exploiting them to remove local populations without requiring a direct paper trail. These local fighters were called mkuku, or spear in Swahili, because they were known to impale victims in order to instill terror. After O12's rise to power, and the agreements instilled in the Concilium Convention, most mkuku were arrested and tried as war criminals. In the short term, they were sent to Corregidor. And what of the victims? Restitution was not always possible in this chaotic period. Many of the non-aligned nations where the elevators were built, locations around the equator like Kenya and Ecuador, had a large number of post-conflict refugees whose homes could not be reclaimed. In a cruel twist of fate, many of the displaced refugees were offered a ticket to the stars, just not as far as the newly discovered exoplanets. No, instead they were offered space on the Lazaretto. Historically, a Lazaretto is a quarantine station for maritime travelers. Inspired by this, the Lazaretto expansion was a pardon program set up by the Foundation. Corregidor inmates would be given pardons in exchange for taking on basic astronaut training, and then worked to rapidly expand the station with a huge number of habitat and hydroponics modules. All of this was done in order to take on refugees from the Equatorial Surge. That's right, the victims and perpetrators of crimes were all crammed together on the growing, unwieldy Corregidor station. In those early days, the Maras gangs were all that stood between the module and total chaos. Many ethnic gangs coalesced into the Vatos and Tzotzis gangs. Packed into a tin can and feeling rightly abandoned, many of them reconstructed traditional folk religions. Vigilantes would often arise, wearing masks and embracing tribal roles as protectors. Soon, Lazaretto's new tenants refused to rot away quietly, though. These were insurgents, guerrillas, tribal warriors, survivors of ethnic conflicts, and mercenaries. Many of them had been sent up to space so that local governments could wash their hands and be done. But by concentrating them into one place, they had just juiced them all up. It took a little squeeze, though, to get Corregidor going. That squeeze was the aforementioned stock market crunch and the ensuing collapse of major donors, combined with the explosion in population. They were privatized and cut loose. Corregidor rapidly started to reorganize itself, less as a prison and more as a self-sufficient colony, just with prison-like work rules. All this was spearheaded by Warden Luis Orozco. Anyone with zero-G experience or engineering knowledge was incredibly valuable and immediately put to work. Further, anyone who was strong, smart, and could follow orders was put to work as security, or, you know, brutal enforcement. Same thing up there. Warden Orozco said it was just all about hard decisions. Where was Corregidor going to get the money for food, air, and water? How would they deal with millions of people in massive bolt-on station modules? As the foundation funding the project collapsed and spun Corregidor Station off into a private enterprise, controversial choices were made. They decided that they just sell off anything and everything on the station that was worth a damn. And really, the only thing worth a damn was the inmates. Orozco started categorizing his sleeping prisoners into three categories, the useful, the valuable, and the surplus. Useful prisoners were the aforementioned, elite assassins, gangster lieutenants, formal military, accountants, fraudsters, people with EVA training, blackmailers, and the like. They would be kept on to establish the new order, 
and would be brought to help the ship make its way through the stars. The valuable prisoners were senior mafioso, triad leaders, white-collar criminals, cartel operatives, political prisoners, agitators, and so on. These prisoners often had outside forces who would pay a good amount to get them off of Corregidor, either people who wanted them free or wanted them dead. And lastly, there were the surplus, criminals who were irredeemably evil and psychopathic. They were too violent or untrustworthy or just unimpressive. They were the first candidates to be disconnected from life support when the ship was running out of resources. Nobody liked the idea of being marked as surplus to requirement. Many of those marked surplus decided that if their fellow citizens in Corregidor would cast them aside, they'd look after each other. Tattoos of surplus, or just STR, in industrial stenciling were common among these former surplus, signaling to fellow castaways that this person, at least, would stand with them. Somewhere between a union and a deck gang, the unwanted surplus still look after their members and descendants. Today, many have ascended to being elite operators in their own right. Once the list was assembled, the bidding began. This was the Red Auction. Warden Orozco was brutally capitalistic with the process. High bids, no discussion, no questions asked, pay accepted in cash, shares, concessions, and contracts. With millions of starving people, there was no room for mercy. Humans were purchased to be released or killed at the whims of the buyers. In the rest of the Earth sphere, this was a feeding frenzy. Not everyone could outbid their rivals. Organized crime turned to murder and kidnap when they couldn't put up the needed cash. The aftermath of the auction was stained with blood, and so this came to be known as the Red Auction. Not everyone in the solar system agreed to simply bid on the lives of their desired targets. Criminal groups like the Mazatlan Cartel, or the Tassani Brothers, tried to break their loved ones out via daring rescues. Meanwhile, the Degralski clan and an unnamed European intelligence agency tried to simply destroy the ship and end its destabilizing influence. This period, amidst the birth of Yu Jing, Pan Oceania, and Hak Islam, was a pouring waterfall of societal changes. Organized crime took similar forms of neo-feudal enterprise, but the key players were abruptly changing. Amidst the Fifth Russian Revolution and a disastrous nanotech war with Yu Jing, many Eastern European Mafia were looking to take advantage of the chaos and looking higher. They were the Struktura, allied families with an affinity for entrepreneurship. Despite their traditional violent tactics, these Eastern European groups had a great desire for legitimate money-making enterprises. It wasn't enough to just run racketeering when they could also sell legitimate insurance and make way more. Their entrepreneurial exploits made them more discreet, more subtle, and their corporate associations taught them the ability to make long-term choices, not just compete for primacy. Back to the other player in that nanotech war, Yu Jing. Many of the triads were willing to play nice with the party and the new imperial system, but, well, not all. Those that resisted the new order of the emperor and the party found themselves ostracized and minimized, too small to compete with the bigger triads and too big to avoid notice. Well, they'd never ever work along the Japanese Yakuza, but Westerners? Well, the old mafia like the cartels and the Bratva were on their way out. These Chinese triads formed into the Golden Sun Group. Not all the old guard were dying out, though. The Consiglio Group formed from several Italian Mafia. But they were already in deep decline and had spent far more time infighting than the Struttura or Golden Sun. Still, they were a bunch of pinheaded Italian mobsters, and they thought that allying with these guys and expanding their business into space was a good idea. They were right. And if you ever have the chance to see a bunch of wise guys in a sci-fi, cyberpunk anime, you take that opportunity. Are you in the Mafia? Am I in the what? Whatever you want to call it. Organized crime. That's total crap. Who told you? These three groups would eventually come to be known as the Entente, and their early interactions with Corregidor Station would prove to be very fruitful. They participated in the Red Auction and established a permanent relationship. But no matter how much the Entente wanted him, there was one man that they could not afford to buy, Juan Sarmiento. He called himself the Count of Montezuma, but everyone knew him as the savior of Corregidor. Four revolutionary groups, three NGOs, two drug cartels, and one trafficking ring all waged a bidding war for the right to kill Sarmiento. Warden Orozco knew that he was going to be worth more as an asset on a bridge than an asset sold off. So, the warden decided that Sarmiento's neck for finding a way to survive, no matter the odds, was worth the risk. And it paid off. He was hired. A man of unsettling politeness and ruthless efficiency, Sarmiento successfully defended the Red Auction with a makeshift military force, relying on trickery, knowledge of the ship, and the ruthless capacity for brutality that had been his hallmark. 
Nobody managed to destroy or sabotage the Corregidor under his watch. Having secured the auction, he took to delivering the most valuable purchases personally. Sarmiento converted the new standing forces of Corregidor into a mercenary company. After all, armies are expensive. Why not make someone else foot the bill for your troops' training and maintenance? The foundations of Corregidor's financial independence were finally secured, first by selling off their cargo, then by repurposing what remained as mercenaries. Ironically, many of the criminals who had been sent there for their violence like the Mkuki warriors were ready to be repurposed as mercenaries once again, this time as units like the Wildcats polyvalent tactical units. Corregidor became a stern society where the weak perished and the strong survived. Their language began to morph, taking on elements from Swahili, Spanish, and complicated astro-engineering terms. They were already hostile to the Earth-based people who had put them there. And why shouldn't they be hostile? They were trapped in a war against extinction, forced together after being othered by the sphere. Whether it was for crimes real or imagined they committed, or crimes they experienced, they were ostracized. From the start, this group would refuse to be assimilated and would refuse to settle down, and never give up their precious autonomy. On the next episode, Corregidor gives up some of its autonomy and enters into an alliance. Scientists create their own utopia, and there are no problems with it whatsoever. If you like this episode, please check out my Patreon. This is the end of the video, so uh, thanks as always for watching. You going to Adepticon? Hey, hit me up, why not?